Good morning and welcome to today, August 12th, or sorry, August 10th, 2012. My name is Chris Kerr. This is The Morning Charge. And this is our fourth episode of our special mega series called Social Revelations. And Social Revelations really is a series about all the spectacular, really mind-blowing and, and game-changing stats that are out there about the impact of social media, what works, what doesn't, and who's actually using it and where. These five facts, or, or five core areas of, of facts, really do change everything you think you know about social media. And unless you happen to be one of the uber, uber, uber elite social media experts, even then, the odds are pretty good, you're still going to be surprised by a number of the stats we're sharing. Today, for example, we, we skipped sharing yesterday because a bunch of news came out yesterday in social media, and we wanted to incorporate some of that into what we're, we're sharing today. Um, so it's that fresh, it's that hot, it's that current. The data is ever-changing, it's swirling around, it, it's a maelstrom out there, and you need to stay on top of it. It doesn't matter what size of business you are, to, to a certain degree. If your business is really very s small by comparison, um, and I'll, I'll put a, a boundary or a, a section on that to a degree. If your business does less than $250,000 in revenue a year, there may be circumstances under which you don't need to pay attention to this stuff because you're just not doing enough volume for the impact to be enough to merit that extra consideration of your time. You've got many other priorities that are urgent demands, and you probably don't have enough budget to go hire somebody else to go do it for you. So generally speaking, and there, there are a lot of wishy-washy parts to that, um, where, yeah, if you're making 50000 you may still really need to know this because it's pertinent to what you're doing or what you're trying to do to market yourself. But as a general rule, if, it, if your business is under 250 k you may not need to spend a lot of time on this today, but within the next year, even that won't matter. You're still going to need to get on top of this within the next year, regardless of what size of business you're in, because the changes, they are coming. <laughs> not, they're not just coming, they're here already, and it's growing faster, more powerful every day. So to recap where we were, well, actually before that, let's talk about what the focus of today's episode is. Today we're concentrating on two specific core areas of importance for social media. We're going to talk about the multiplier effect, and we're going to talk about social trust. Both are hugely important to this process. So starting off, like we do every day um, in this program series, we're going to do a little recap of what we did yesterday. So yesterday, or Wednesday, we learned that business has ignored the demographics of the social media markets that they, or sorry, let me rephrase that. Business has ignored the demographics of the social media they market to. In other words, they don't know who they're talking to. They know they have followers. That's the extent of their knowledge base. That's not enough, and, and we've already proven that. We've shown exactly why that doesn't come close to meeting their own needs, let alone the needs of their, their viewers, followers, and customers. Which led us to the next point, we learned that less than one-third of business tracks social media ROI. In fact, across business in general, the number drops down to a little over 10%. We learned that 62% of all small business activity on social media took place in niche social media. That's because we know that the 38% that are attributed to Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn um, that 38%, that's, that's the, ex the, the biggest numbers for any one social media that they participate in. All the rest are small social media. And by small, we still talk about ones that are 2.2 million and up in actual members, active member base. So we're not talking about tiny. We're not talking about six people who are showing up on a Saturday meeting. We're talking about big, powerful, well-known social networks but they aren't in the top seven. So to ex expand on that a little bit, 
if the majority of small business activity on social media is happening on niche social media and they're getting better results from that and that's 80 percent of the u.s economy is small business maybe there's something to niche social media that other businesses need to start paying attention to big medium and small businesses need to get a lot more familiar with this small business or niche social media that more directly talk to the kinds of customers you're trying to reach to. We learned that almost 80% of businesses that use social media to drive web traffic were able to generate higher quality leads. We also learned that there were huge differences between how big businesses and small businesses approach customer acquisition through social media. Basically, we learned that the demographics of social media that we market to need to match who we want to sell to. And right now, very, very, very few, less than about 3% of companies, are paying any attention to that at all. They simply go, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, we're done. Now they're starting to pay more attention to LinkedIn. Um, but generally speaking, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, we're done. Hmm. Now, as I've gone through this, I've had a number of um, customers or people who are paying attention to this reach out to me and say, what about Google Plus? So far, we haven't talked about it much at all. Well, we'll get to that in a little bit today. Um, because one of the things that, that came out yesterday was something from Mashable. And it really fits into this discussion of the multiplier effect really, really well. Now, what do I mean by the multiplier effect? Well, by that I mean it's the impact of social sharing. So the more often your content is shared, the better it is. It doesn't matter on what basis. Um, it impacts your SEO, your marketing, your follower engagement, web traffic, lead gen, sales, um, any ROI you're thinking of for social media the multiplier effect has an impact on because it's how many times it's shared for all intents and purposes the more often it's shared the more viral you've heard that expression uh, the more valuable that particular post is for you so yesterday Mashable came out with this particular article and, and the article talks about why Google Plus is a ghost town now, taking a look at the number of users, Facebook has 901 million, Google 170 million, LinkedIn 161, Twitter 140. These numbers are official numbers from each of the channels, but we've already seen official numbers from each of the channels that are higher and lower than these. So all of that take as rough ballparks. These networks are growing so quickly, they can't keep track of it themselves. So not, not to that level of, of accuracy we know those are the ballparks and it's it's within the range but looking at this it looks like google plus has more users than linkedin and twitter so that makes it a pretty powerful group and it really defeats the concept or the the, the argument that google is google plus is a ghost town until you take a look at the sharing properties and, and the, the traffic activity levels of each and that's what the Mashable article talks about. So, in terms of sharing, for every 100 million users, the average number likely to share a story, Twitter comes in first, in a big way. With 197.3 people, it's, it makes all the others tiny by comparison. Facebook is next at 41.8, LinkedIn next at 15.2, and Google Plus at 6.0. So it's highly unlikely that you're going to get a share on Google Plus by comparison to Twitter. What does it mean, though? I mean, that, that those graphics make it look really great. Well, if you take that 197.3 and divide it by 100 million, which is what the stats represent, the figures show for every 100 million users, the average number likely to share a story, that works out to... 0.00001973% chance that your story is going to get shared. I, 
I can already hear the massive trampling of feet leaving to go to the local grocery store or convenience store to buy the lottery tickets because you got much better odds of winning the lottery than having a lot of stories shared regularly. Much better odds. Unless your content is worth it or unless you're networked to the right spots and your content is worth it. But that's the overall statistics for the number of times shares happen on those four social media. So logically, if you want to maximize it, maximize the number of chances that somebody might share your story, you want to be on as many social networks as you can be, connecting to as many people as possible, so that there's more opportunity for more people to share your, your posts and your updates. Because at this percentage rate for Twitter, that ain't going to get you very far. But keep in mind, Twitter literally is almost five times its nearest competitor in terms of likelihood of sharing. And Facebook is almost three times that of LinkedIn, which is, again, almost three times that of Google+. These are big, big differences between the, the, the four different sites. And we talked a lot about the idea that big business loves Twitter and Facebook. They love it. This is part of the reason why. They've bought into the advantage of the activity and the resharability on Twitter and Facebook because it drives SEO. The more often your posts are shared, liked, engaged with, the better the rankings are on search engines, which drives more web traffic. Plus, the links themselves usually drive more web traffic, and you get more eyeballs on, on the links. So, if nothing else, their hope is if they throw enough spaghetti at the wall, they'll get more volume of traffic, and somewhere in the traffic, results are coming in the form of more leads. And that's happening successfully. We already saw the stats on that. Because there's so much volume, they can drive that kind of attention. I'm not sure that most small businesses can afford what it takes to generate that kind of traffic. Even though the social networks are free, unless you have a way of reaching out to hundreds of social networks to get the same kind of impact, it's hard to visualize how you're going to be able to get the kind of media attention it takes to get those links looked at. There are ways, but we're comparing budgets of billions versus mm, you know what your budget is. So just kind of think about that in, in context. But I will say this for it. Uh, Ford, last year, I think, um, launched the new Ford Explorer. I think it's the Ford Explorer or Ford Focus, sorry, um, on Facebook rather than on the Super Bowl ads. And they had the best Ford product release they've ever had by comparing the results of the Facebook ad versus the Super Bowl ad. The Facebook ad kicked the butt of every previous Super Bowl ad that Ford's ever had. Think about that in, in terms of the power of this sharing and multiplicity. You can't share a TV ad. You can't share a radio ad. You can't share... You, you might be able to share a newspaper ad. You, you have a pass on thing. But you don't get to share as often the others. Um, the only sharing might be you might have multiple people in the room. After that, the sharing stops. And we'll get into the trust factor later, which is part of the reason why Ford's uh, Facebook promotion was so much more powerful than the Super Bowl. But a lot of it comes down to sharing as well. Now, in terms of shares, Mashable's article then goes on to um, talk about more specific aspects. And I just took a, a sampling of them here. So business stories, which is what we're focusing on, you have 45.7% of business stories are shared on Facebook. 
Twitter will share 32.1%, LinkedIn almost 20%, and Google Plus almost 3%. So the strongest business sharing site in that context would be Facebook, then Twitter, then LinkedIn. And this is one of the highest rankings Google Plus gets, so take advantage of it while you can. If you flip over to entertainment, though, that's where Facebook, Twitter really shine, and you see LinkedIn completely drop off. You see Twitter go up by almost half. Um, and technology is about the same for Facebook and Twitter as it is for entertainment. They're much happier to share that information than business information. So the, the big differences that I want to show you though, Facebook, business, it's a, a significant number, but it's not that significant. It's still between 45 and 50 percent. Twitter for business, 32 to 46. That's a huge difference. If you're promoting something in entertainment or technology, Twitter's your friend. If you're doing it in business, ugh, people are not as fond. They still do it more than they do in, in lots of other sites, but it's a big drop off. It's not as focused on business. And then Google Plus, when you're going between 0 0.8 and 3, you're, you're not even in the, the ballpark. So entertainment, LinkedIn's not in the ballpark. Technology, LinkedIn, not in the ballpark. Business, LinkedIn at 20% share rate. Considering it's all about business, that's a powerful share. Whereas this is a volume share, and this is a volume share, this is a powerful share. It may not be high volume, but it's interested parties. So again, you have to keep this in mind. This is particularly significant data. And I, I threw this in from that same article to, to put it in context as well. This again is why business, larger business loves Facebook and Twitter. It's because the activity rate is much higher in these two than the, it is in virtually any other social network. It also means that if you take a look at this scaled back, that's why Twitter has a half-life for each status update of 2.8 hours. The volume is so high that it just gets buried too quickly. Facebook, I think, again, is 3.2 hours, and it's largely because the status wall just gets buried by so much other stuff. LinkedIn, not as much. People are in there doing a lot of things, but they're not posting to status walls as often. Mine happens to get swamped simply because I have so many recruiters posting open jobs that I'm connected to. Um, so I get a huge volume of that. I also get a huge volume of people who are connecting to each other. Um, because I have a large connection base, that's obviously more likely to happen. Which leads us to social trust. So we just talked about how you multiply things and, and why you, you, as a big business, you'd concentrate on Facebook and Twitter to a certain degree. But we also talked about the, the fact that that deals in sheer volume. It doesn't deal in relevancy. So when you take a look at the relevancy side of things, which we did to a little bit in there, they would be far better off dealing with LinkedIn on business than they would be Facebook and Twitter combined. But they haven't figured out how to make that work. It just visually isn't catching them yet. Why isn't it catching them yet? Well, take a look at social trust and I think we'll get a, a better insight in that. So social trust is the real power of social media. I told you about Ford's Facebook launch this past year. Um, the amazing impact that had. And I'm sorry, it wasn't 2011, it was 2012. Um, was far more powerful than their uh, best ever Super Bowl ad. And anyone who knows the advertising world, Super Bowl ads are your home runs. These are your knock them out the park. 
this is going to pay for your, your kind of scenario. Um, so to have that kind of success from Facebook is wonderful, but they didn't do it through Facebook advertising. Here's why it works. Social media engagement and Facebook engagement stats. 70% of consumers trust social media reviews from strangers. Over 90% trust social media reviews from peers and friends. That's dated April 6th, 2012. Remember, 90% friends and peers, 70% complete strangers. And what do Americans go onto social networks to find out? What do they want to know? Well, they do it to stay in touch with friends at 67%. Family at 64%. We like our friends more than our family. <laughs> Not by much, but that's, that's what that stat shows. 50% want to reconnect with old friends. Way down at 14%, they want to connect with people who share similar interests. 9% want to make new friends. 5% read comments from celebrities, athletes, or politicians. And 3% potential romantic partners. Notice business doesn't show up anywhere on that list. People don't do it to do business. They go to social network sites to be social. <laughs> I, you, you would think that wouldn't need to be communicated, but clearly it does because of the following stats. Business Insider is a fairly well-known um, media website. And recently, David Malik um, posted an article about this subject matter. And here the, they say, in this particular study, 92% of people trust recommendations from friends and family above all other forms of advertising when making a purchasing decision. And that number is up nearly 20% from 2007. However, here's the stuff that they, they really highlighted that makes the big difference. Fewer than half, and th this is a Nielsen study, fewer than half of all people still find paid traditional television, magazine, and newspaper ads credible. They don't believe them. <laughs> Those numbers were down 24, 20, and 25 percent respectively since 2009. Not since, you know, 1980. This is since 2009. As for online reviews, 70% of people profess to trust in the appraisals of up to 15... Or sorry, let me start again on that. 70% of people profess trust in appraisals. And that's up 15% over the past four years. So this is of complete strangers. So if you go to a, a review site like Yelp, where complete strangers are saying, hey, this was my experience. 70% of us would trust that information over any other form of advertising out there. And it's not like that's advertising, but it, if you're putting it on that level playing field, that's the description. So think about that for a second. We would prefer to hear from a complete stranger than to pay attention to um, any kind of advertising. Hmm. So in other words, if you put ads on a site where people aren't paying attention to ads and they don't like them and don't trust them and you're wondering why your ads aren't working, maybe we have an answer to that. More from a, a very recent Nielsen um, post, again, April 10th. So word of mouth recommendations and reviews, either from someone you know or a stranger's opinions, are far more trusted in terms of your buying decisions. And all this information drives a lot of positives towards social media or other forms of user-generated content. And I'm just going to do a, a straight comparison here. Recommendations from people I know trust completely or somewhat, 92%. Consumer opinions posted online, 70%.
Ads on social networks trusted 36%. All of you who've come to me or have come to any social media expert and have said, social media doesn't work because I put my ad on and nothing happened. That's entirely your fault, <laughs> to, to be real honest. You put an ad on a social network. You don't like looking at ads on social networks, so why would you expect anyone else would? It's not the advertising that's important. It's the engagement. How did you get them involved in what you do? It, that's not advertising. I'm sorry, it, it's not. And take a look at these stats. So traditional paid media are still trusted by a great number of consumers. Influence is on the decline, and we just saw that. About half would say they trust ads on TV or in magazines or in newspapers. That's in spite of the fact that global advertising spend increased by 7%. In particular, a large increase, 10%, in television advertising. So, in other words, the more you advertise, the more people don't like advertising. By a doubling effect, in other words, it was 25%, roughly, between 20 and 25%, believe ads less now that you've increased advertising by 10%. Hmm, I wonder why. <laughs> you throw more advertising at us, and we like it less. Hmm. Among the more marketer-driven sources for online information and advertising, Company websites and permission-based emails fared well. 58% of online consumers trusted information they found on a company website, and half trusted emails they signed up to receive. This isn't the spam ones. Those numbers dropped down to around 6%. But the ones that you sign up to receive, about half of them are trusted. Which should be a warning sign to even those. Next up on the trust scale are search engine ads which are trusted by 40% of those surveyed. 36% trust online video ads, 30% believe banner ad messages, and that's increased by over a quarter since 2007. That's, the, the, for marketers, that's a big number. That's a, a, an important number to track. Sponsored ads on social networks are trusted by 36% of respondents. So yes, they work better than banner ads, but, but, they don't work very well. Hmm. Not when two-thirds of the public don't really like them and don't want to see them and don't want to use them. Mobile ads have increased trust levels 61% since 2007 and 21% since 2009. Um, most trusted are display ads, both videos and banners on tablets and smartphones which are trusted by 30% of global respondents. So it's on a growth curve, but it's still lousy. Text ads on mobile phones are trusted slightly less at 29%. Yes, you send me a text ad on my mobile phone, I don't like you. It's pretty simple. Uh, there are two that I accept because they're good friends of mine, but I don't like the ads. And that's true for just about everybody. Interestingly, Nielsen found that relevance often correlated strongly with trust suggesting that online marketers could raise trust levels by making ads more relevant. What have we been talking about? We've been talking about the fact that Americans go online on social networks to be social. So if you're going to advertise to them, at least make it a socially relevant ad. Hmm. Nielsen says relevance goes with trust. Buy my stuff has nothing to do with social activity. So, why would I trust it? It's got nothing to do with me being where I am on my social network. You don't give a flying rip about what I'm doing, so why should I care about your ad? Here's some more information. Again, 90% of consumers trust peer recommendations. Overall, when you get right down to the end of it, as of um, the start of this year, only 14% trust online advertising. Only 18% of traditional TV campaigns generate a positive ROI. So all of the people who are bashing their 30% ROI in social media, compare that to the 18% that traditional TV advertising gets. 
think about that for a minute. And business in general just threw an extra 10% between last year and this year in television advertising. And keep this in mind. 90% of people that can TiVo ads do. Advertising, although it works as a branding tool, advertising for direct sales is literally seven to nine times less effective than social media engagement and peer recommendations. You have to keep that in mind. So advertising isn't the thing that works on social media. It's engaging consumers. That produces your peer recommendations and referrals. And that's what got Ford their most successful campaign, if you want to call it that, ever, based on that Facebook launch. They've never had a product launch that successful, based on one, for lack of a, a better term, marketing activity. So that today is the, the morning charge and our special fourth episode on social revelations. What we learned overall is stop talking at your customers, start talking with them, and all of the facts that categorically prove that that's, this is what works. This has been Social Revelations, our fourth episode, The Multiplier Effect on Social Trust, part of our six-episode mega-series called Social Revelations. Thanks so much for joining us on the Morning Charge today. My name again is Chris Kerr, and we really are thrilled to have you on this journey with us. and can't wait to show you what's coming up on Monday and Tuesday now for social revelations.